new space that you have here at Unity Spiritual Center of Manhattan. My goodness, it just felt so joyful to walk in here. And I want to celebrate with you what your consciousness has created here. It's just stunning. What a great space. So I'm here today, uh, your true self-worth. Back in June, I had surgery on my left knee, and after a time of recovery, um, I was ready to do something. I was so blessed. One Saturday, Millie came over and said, come on, Mom, we're going garage sailing. And I was like, but, but she's like, come on, I'll take care of you. We're going garage sailing. And it was a beautiful morning, and we hit this one particular garage sale where they had all the kinds of books that I like. And I was like, oh, I've read this one. Oh, I love that one. Oh, this. And, and this was one of the books that was there. And I was really attracted to the, to the colorful front of it and the great stories. And as I was looking at it, I thought about Unity of Manhattan because I, I really like the way that you include the children in your service. And I really like the way that I get to start my lesson at, at a child's level, you know, talking about Toads and birds, I, I like that. You know, I like to tell stories. Stories are the way that we pass our values on to the next generation. And stories are the way that we make meaning of our life. And stories are the way that we connect with each other. You know, a really good story can tell us about each other. So I, I was looking forward to it. And, and I got back in the car, and I'm looking through the book. And I said to Millie, Let's put on a show. No. <laughs> let's get together and let's get hold of Mark and let's put on a service at Unity of Manhattan that we create together. And let's take a story out of the book and let's build an entire service around it. And we just thought that was the greatest idea. And I can't imagine a greater sense of abundance in my life than to connect with my daughter who wrote all the music for the service, and to create this theme, building one upon the other. What a great sense of abundance to use our gifts, our God-given gifts and talents, and to express that with you in mind. What a sense of our true self-worth. And what a sense of abundance. That's living in the kingdom of heaven. So that's what we as children of God do. Little toads wink and fishes swim and birdies sing, tweets sing, and I didn't know it, but muskrats dive. <laughs> and we as children of God, we create. We love each other. We take care of each other. And it's a wonderful expression of our true self-worth. It's great living in the kingdom of heaven and that's what most of us want to do. But it doesn't always work out that way. And most of us spend time in our real life trying to get more of the kingdom of ha heaven into our daily life. So I thought about this. And I thought, you know, one of the things that I think separates us from the kingdom of heaven is competition. You know, back when we lived in caves and clans and tribes, it really, competition really worked. I mean, there was a pecking order. And it really helped us to know, overall, where we fit in the pecking order. If somebody wanted your space around the fire, or they wanted you to do more than your share of work, they let you know it. And it really helped if you had an immediate overall sense of your place in the pecking order. Sometimes there was a conflict, and you came out on top, and your place in the pecking order was raised. And there were other times where there was a conflict, and your ranking was diminished. It really helped if you had an almost immediate, unconscious access to where you were in the system, and who you could rely on to support you, what your strength was what your skill level and your intelligence was that was going to get you through a challenge. Further, if you had been physically or socially defeated, it was really important that you act meeker than what was maybe called for. 
the future would probably bring the same kind of same defeats. And so it was really good if you could undervalue yourself, you lived longer. You got along better in the tribe. And we have carried this behavior out of the cave and into our evolved modern society. So our overall sense of self-worth, even in modern times, often errs on the low side, and we tend to undervalue ourselves. But in modern society, we don't live in one single tribe. We go from home, we go to church, we go to work, we go to social activities, and there is no such thing as an overall ranking. It's different in every situation. This is the way when we carry our rank from one place into a different social setting, this is a way that we tend to stay out of the kingdom of heaven. In, in a book called The Undervalued Self by Dr. Elaine Aaron, she says that whenever we are ranking ourselves, we, based on this evolutionary tendency, we are automatically undervaluing our true self-worth. And she's done research that shows that when we have suffered a defeat in one social situation, we tend to carry those strong emotions into the next situation. And these experiences can build on each other and block us from our highest good. According to Aaron, this is how it works. Let's say that you're at work and you get a text from a friend. You've asked this friend if they would go out with you. And you get a text back saying, mm, no, not going to do that. And this is at the same time that you're about to head out to the copy machine. So you have just suffered one social defeat, and you head out to the copy machine, and there's three people standing around, and there's a little jostling to see who's going to go next in the copy machine. And the next thing you know, your little caveman mind is saying, well, why did he do that? I didn't deserve that. I, what did I do to tick him off? You've carried over one defeat to the next. It really had nothing to do with you. And then that night, you go out to play softball. You just love going out to play with your friends. And you know, you're know you up to bat, and you're ready to go. And instead of swinging to hit that ball, you hold back. Because you've carried over that fear of failure. And you fail to swing, and you strike out. You didn't want another failure, yet this is what happened. Because unconsciously, you carried that defeat forward. You took your anxiety into the next social situation. Your tricky mind goes to the undervalued self, and it's blocking you from your true self-worth and keeping you out of the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. As I said earlier, stories are a way that we pass along our values to the next generation. and. There's a story in the Bible that I think addresses this perfectly. It's called the parable of the prodigal and his brother. It's found in Luke chapter 15. And Jesus tells the story of a man who has two sons. And the younger son says, Father, give me my inheritance. I'd like to have it now. And the father gives him his inheritance. And the, the younger son goes off to another land and he squanders his inheritance. And he finds himself working on a farm, and he's feeding the pigs, which is really something uh, abhorrent to a, 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 young, a, a young Jewish man. And he realizes that back on his father's property, he could be living the life of a servant that would actually be better than the one that he's living feeding the pigs. So he decides that he's going to return home and beg his father's forgiveness. Now, this is where I think the story gets really interesting. Because when he gets back, it's instead of his father sending him off to the fields and sending him off to feed the pigs, imagine his surprise when he finds out his father welcomes him home and actually throws a big feast and kills the fatted calf. And enter onto the scene the elder brother. Now, note here. There's already some kind of ranking going on. Elder. It implies that elder is better than younger. And there's another ranking going on, because we know from the story that the younger brother has squandered his inheritance. 
So we know that the elder brother should be held in higher esteem by anybody who knows him, especially the father. So the older brother goes to his father and says, Listen, for all these years, I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never even given me even so much as a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. The elder brother is pulling rank. He's judging himself against his younger brother, and he's judging himself against his father's love. He's definitely not in touch with his own true self-worth and not in touch with the fact that he is loved by his father. He is not experiencing the kingdom of heaven. The elder brother is trying to establish his social position. He's fighting for his identity. And he's demanding fairness. This is what Dr. Aaron calls ranking. Ranking is our innate tendency to see and improve our position in a social hierarchy, to be a separate and distinct individual, and to try to demand fairness. The elder son was ranking himself with the brother. And whenever we rank ourselves, we automatically, in our caveman mind, undervalue our true self-worth. The next thing that happens in this parable is an example of the wisdom that is contained in all of the great religions of the world. What happens next is an expression of the beloved children of God that we came here to be. Although ranking is an important factor in our daily life and completely dominates in many situations, in the end, it is linking that connects us with our fellow man and that trumps ranking. Aaron defines linking as our innate tendency to be drawn to and affectionate with others, to be interested in them and to want to help them whenever we can. Linking trumps ranking because of its biological, emotional, and spiritual importance. The father links with the son. He says to his elder son, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. He is affectionate and connecting himself with his son, and he wants to help him. He says, you will always be with me. All that is mine is yours. You and I are connected. We are linked. The great spiritual principle here is linking. And one of the ways that people link with others is to offer food. The father killed the fatted calf. The, he threw a party to celebrate his son's homecoming. That which was lost was now found. Another way that people link is forgiveness. The prodigal son sought his father's forgiveness. Forgiveness is a shift in thinking for someone who has harmed you. And it has nothing to do with reconciliation, forgetting, or justice. When you're ready to forgive, it's a powerful choice that you can make and it can lead to greater relationships. Forgiveness is a way to link with others, to reestablish wholeness. Giving empathy is another way to link with others. Sharing a mood that they're in, reflecting their feelings. It's not what we say that matters, it's what we do. Linking has more to do with actions than with words. And our love for others can transcend all ranking. Spiritually, selfless love is the center of all great religions, which teach that doing for others is its own great reward. Linking is a path to the kingdom of heaven. 
And of course, the most important person to link with is ourselves. So here's the rule on how to heal a relationship. Where ranking was, let linking be. Switching from ranking to linking automatically takes the undervalued self out of the equation because it's only when we're ranking in comparison with other people that we fall into this undervalued self. It's innate to rank ourselves too low when we do that. Once we are linking, we are primed to care and to be cared for mutually. Take this idea of linking and ranking into your life this week. Look at your activities and listen to the voice in your head. Listen to the conversation that's going on and you might just be surprised at what you hear. I've been working with this idea since I first read this book and to tell you the truth, I have been astounded at the conversations that I have heard in my head because I never thought they were going on. And once I started listening with this lens of ranking and linking, I started hearing things that were going on in my head that were in totally benign situations, and they were just this blip. They were so fast, and I started catching them. For example, this last Thursday morning, at 9 o'clock, the cable guy showed up. Now, I had just gotten off the phone with the receptionist at the doctor's office where I was trying to schedule a follow-up appointment for my knee. And I had suffered a defeat on the phone with the receptionist because the only appointment that she had available for me was four weeks out. And I had a little conflict around that and I came off not getting what I wanted. <laughs> so I was a bit upset and enter into this scene, the cable guy. Now I was already down one with the cable guy because I really don't know enough about the cable in my house to answer all of his questions. So he comes in and he's working on the TV and the thing to remember here is even though I was kind of one down with a cable guy, what was really at work was the fact that I had just had this defeat with the receptionist at the orthopedist office. That was what was at work on my mind. So he's coming in and he's working on my TV and all of a sudden I catch this thought in my head this silly little caveman thought and what I'm hearing myself ruminating on in my head is boy he must think I'm some kind of a smoz to be here at home at nine o'clock on a Thursday morning when I could be out working he probably thinks that I should be out working like he is he must be wondering what's wrong with me that I can't be out there working right now now this is just a whole bunch of self-conscious mind trash. I mean, come on now. The cable company demands that I be at home to meet the cable guy. <laughs> There's just absolutely nothing to this at all. But rational logic has nothing to do with these situations. I was carrying over the undervalued self from one situation to another. Now, I caught myself doing this ranking, and I immediately wanted to shift to linking, if only to make my own life better for the rest of the day. And so I thought about this, and I said to the cable guy, hey, cable guy, the morning coffee is already gone, but I've got water and I've got Coke. Would, would you like something to drink? And he said, no, I'm fine, thank you, that's fine. And even though he declined my offer, I still felt good. I didn't carry over that feeling into the next situation of my life. Offering food and hospitality is biblical. That's what the father did for the prodigal son. He killed the fatted calf and he threw a feast. He told his other son, all that I have is yours. Sometimes something as simple as offering a little wrapped peppermint to your seatmate on an airplane flight <coughs> can make the whole trip better. Even if all you want to do is work, you've set up that linking connection at the get-go. As you go about your week, let's remember the rule for healing a relationship is where ranking was, let linking be. 
And I'm going to add to that an affirmation. I am a child of God, and I choose to live in the kingdom of heaven. Where ranking was, let linking be. I am a child of God, and I choose to live in the kingdom of heaven. Let's say this together. I'm going to break it into two parts, and I'm going to say it, and then I'm going to ask you to repeat it with me. Where ranking was, let linking be. Together, where ranking was, let linking be. I am a child of God, and I choose to live in the kingdom of heaven. Together, I am a child of God, and I choose to live in the kingdom of heaven. This is your true self worth. This is the time in our...